The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford. Section 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Goethe, Volume 1, by Johann von Goethe. Translated by John Oxenford. Section 11. It was not long before a very peculiar interest of my own arose. Young Derones, for so I will call the boy whose acquaintance I still kept up, was, with the exception of his boasting, a youth of good manners and very courteous demeanor. He made me acquainted with his sister, a girl who was a few years older than we were, and a very pleasant, well-grown girl, of regular form, brown complexion, black hair and eyes, her whole deportment had about it something quiet, even sad. I tried to make myself agreeable to her in every way, but I could not attract her notice. Young girls think themselves much more advanced than younger boys, and while aspiring to young men, they assume the manner of an aunt towards the boy, whose first inclination is turned towards them. With a younger brother of his, I had no acquaintance. Sometimes, when their mother had gone to rehearsals or was out visiting, we met at her house to play and amuse ourselves. I never went there without presenting the fair one with a flower, a fruit, or something else, which she always received very courteously and thanked me for most politely. But I never saw her sad look brighten, and found no trace of her having given me a further thought. At last I fancied I had discovered her secret. The boy showed me a crayon drawing of a handsome man behind her mother's bed, which was hung with elegant silk curtains, remarking at the same time, with a sly look, that this was not Papa, but just the same as Papa, and as he glorified this man, and told me many things in his circumstantial and ostentatious manner, I thought I had discovered that the girl might belong to the father, but the other two children to the intimate friend. I thus explained to myself her melancholy look, and loved her for it all the more. My liking for this girl assisted me in bearing the braga docio of her brother, who did not always keep within bounds. I had often to endure prolix accounts of his exploits, how he had already often fought without wishing to injure the other, all for the mere sake of honor. He had always contrived to disarm his adversary, and had then forgiven him. Nay, he was such a good fencer that he was once very much perplexed by striking the sword of his opponent up into a tree, so that it was not easy to be got at. What much facilitated my visits to the theater was that my free ticket, coming from the hands of the Schuthis, gave me access to any of the seats, and therefore also to those in the proscenium. This was very deep, after the French style, and was bordered on both sides with seats, which surrounded by a low rail, ascended in several rows one behind another so that the first seats were but a little elevated above the stage. The whole was considered a place of special honor, and was generally used only by officers, although the nearness of the actors destroyed, I will not say all illusion, but in a measure all enjoyment. I have thus experienced and seen with my own eyes the usage or abuse of which Voltaire so much complains, if, when the house was very full, as such time as troops were passing through the town, officers of distinction strove for this place of honor, which was generally occupied already, some rows of benches and chairs were placed in the proscenium on the stage itself, and nothing remained for the heroes and heroines but to reveal their secrets in the, in the very limited space between the uniforms and orders. I have even seen the hyperminstra performed under such circumstances. The curtain did not fall between the acts, and I must yet mention a strange custom, which I thought quite extraordinary. 
as its inconsistency with art was to me as a good german boy quite unendurable the theatre was considered the greatest sanctuary and any disturbance occurring there would have been instantly resented as the highest crime against the majesty of the public therefore in all comedies two grenadiers stood with their arms grounded in full view at the two sides of the back of the scene and were witnesses to all that occurred in the bosom of the family since as i said before the curtain did not fall between the acts two others while music struck up relieved guard by coming from the wings directly in front of the first who retired in the same measured manner now if such a practice was well fitted to destroy all that is called illusion on the stage it is the more striking because it was done at a time when according to diderot's principles and examples the most natural naturalness was required upon the stage and a perfect deception was proposed as the proper aim of theatrical art tragedy however was absolved from any such military police regulations and the heroes of antiquity had the right of guarding themselves nevertheless the same grenadiers stood near enough behind the side scenes i will also mention that i saw diderot's father of a family and the philosophers of palisso and still perfectly remember the figure of the philosopher in the latter piece going upon all fours and biting into a raw head of lettuce all this theatrical variety could not however keep us children always in the theatre in fine weather we played in front of it and in the neighborhood and committed all manner of absurdities which especially on sundays and festivals by no means corresponded to our personal appearance for i and my comrades then appeared dressed as i described myself in the tale with the hat under the arm and a little sword the hilt of which was ornamented with a large silk knot one day when we had long gone in this way and Doronis had joined us he took it into his head to affirm that i had insulted him and must give him satisfaction i could not in truth conceive what was the cause of this but i accepted his challenge and was going to draw my sword however he assured me that in such cases it was customary to go to secluded spots in order to be able to settle the matter more conveniently we therefore went behind some barns and placed ourselves in the proper position the duel took place in a somewhat theatrical style the blades clasped and the thrusts followed close upon each other but in the heat of the combat he remained with the point of his sword lodged in the knot of my hilt this was pierced through and he assured me that he had received the most complete satisfaction then embraced me also theatrically and we went to the next coffee-house to refresh ourselves with a glass of almond milk after our mental agitation and to knit more closely the old bond of friendship on this occasion i will relate another adventure which also happened to me at the theatre although at a later time i was sitting very quietly in the pit with one of my playmates and we looked with pleasure at a pas seul, which was executed with much skill and grace by a pretty boy about our own age the son of a french dancing master who was passing through the city after the fashion of dancers he was dressed in a close vest of red silk which ending in a short hoop petticoat like a runner's apron floated above the knee we had given our meed of applause to this young artist with the whole public when i i know not how it occurred to me to make a moral reflection i said to my companion how handsomely this boy was dressed and how well he looked who knows in how tattered a jacket he may sleep to-night all had already arisen but the crowd prevented our moving a woman who had sat by me and who was now standing close beside me 
chanced to be the mother of the young artist and felt much offended by my reflection unfortunately she knew german enough to understand me and spoke it just as much as was necessary to scold she abused me violently who was i she would like to know that had a right to doubt the family and respectability of this young man at all events she would be bound he was as good as i and his talents might probably procure him a fortune of which i could not even venture to dream this moral lecture she read me in the crowd and made those about me wonder what rudeness i had committed as i could neither excuse myself nor escape from her i was really embarrassed and when she paused for a moment said without thinking well why do you make such a noise about it today read tomorrow dead footnote a german proverb hute roth morgen toth End footnote. these words seemed to strike the woman dumb she stared at me and moved away from me as soon as it was in any degree possible i thought no more of my words only some time afterwards they occurred to me when the boy instead of continuing to perform became ill and that very dangerously whether he died or not i cannot say such intimations by an unseasonably or even improperly spoken word were held in repute even by the ancients and it is very remarkable that the forms of belief and of superstition have always remained the same among all people and in all times from the first day of the occupation of our city there was no lack of constant diversion especially for children and young people plays and balls parades and marches through the town attracted our attention in all directions the last particularly were always increasing and the soldier's life seemed to us very merry and agreeable the residence of the king's lieutenant at our house procured us the advantage of seeing by decrees all the distinguished persons in the french army and especially of beholding close at hand the leaders whose names had always been made known to us by reputation thus we looked from stairs and landing places as if from galleries very conveniently upon the generals who passed by more than all the rest do i remember the prince Soubise as a handsome courteous gentleman but most distinctly the marshal de broglio who was a younger man not tall but well built lively nimble and abounding in keen glances betraying a clever mind he repeatedly came to see the king's lieutenant and it was easily noticed that they were conversing on weighty matters we had scarcely become accustomed to having strangers quartered upon us in the first three months when a rumor was obscurely circulated that the allies were on the march and that duke ferdinand of brunswick was coming to drive the french from the main of these who could not boast of any special success in war no high opinion was held and after the battle of rossbach it was thought they might be dispersed the greatest confidence was placed in duke ferdinand and all those favorable to prussia awaited with eagerness their delivery from the yoke hitherto borne my father was in somewhat better spirits my mother was apprehensive she was wise enough to see that a small present evil might easily be exchanged for a great affliction since it was but too plain that the french would not advance to meet the duke but would wait an attack in the neighborhood of the city a defeat of the french a flight a defense of the city if it were only to cover their rear and hold the bridge a bombardment a sack all these presented themselves to the excited imagination and gave anxiety to both parties my mother who could bear everything but suspense imparted her fears to the count through the interpreter she received the answer usual in such cases 
she might be quite easy, for there was nothing to fear, and should keep quiet and mention the matter to no one. Many troops passed through the city. We learned that they halted at Bergen. The coming and going, the riding and running constantly increased, and our house was in an uproar day and night. At this time I often saw Marshal de Broglio, always cheerful, always the same in look and manner, and I was afterwards pleased to find a man whose form had made such a good and lasting impression upon me, so honorably mentioned in history. Thus, after an unquiet Passion Week, the Good Friday of 1759 arrived. A profound stillness announced the approaching storm. We children were forbidden to quit the house. My father had no quiet and went out. The battle began. I ascended to the garret, where indeed I was prevented from seeing the country road, but could very well hear the thunder of cannon and the general discharge of musketry. After some hours we saw the first symptoms of the battle in a line of wagons in which the wounded, with various sad mutilations and gestures, were slowly drawn by us, to be taken to the convent of St. Mary, now transformed into a hospital. The compassion of the citizens was instantly moved. Beer, wine, bread, and money were distributed to those who were yet able to take them. But when, some time after, wounded and captive Germans were seen in the train, the pity knew no limits, and it seemed as if everybody would strip himself of every movable that he possessed to assist his suffering countrymen. The prisoners, however, were in evidence of a battle unfavorable to the Allies. My father, whose party feelings made him quite certain that these would come off victorious, had the violent temerity to go forth to meet the expected victors, without thinking that the beaten party might pass over him in their flight. He first repaired to his garden before the Freiburg Gate, where he found everything lonely and quiet then ventured to the Bornheim Heath, where he soon descried various stragglers of the army who were scattered and amused themselves by shooting at the boundary stones so that the rebounding lead whizzed round the head of the inquisitive wanderer. He therefore considered it more prudent to go back and learned on inquiry that the report of the firing might have before informed him that all stood well for the French, and that there was no thought of retreating. Reaching home in an ill humor, the sights of his wounded and captured countrymen brought him altogether out of his usual self-command. He also caused various donations to be given to the passers-by, but only the Germans were to have them, which was not always possible, as fate had packed together both friend and foe. My mother and we children, who had already relied on the Count's word, and had therefore passed a tolerably quiet day, were highly rejoiced, and my mother doubly consoled the next day, when having consulted the oracle of her treasure box by the prick of a needle, she received a very comfortable answer, both for present and future. We wished our father similar faith and feelings. We flattered him as much as we could. We entreated him to take some food, from which he had abstained all day. But he repulsed our caresses and every enjoyment, and betook himself to his chamber. Our joy, however, was not interrupted. The affair was decided. The king's lieutenant, who, against his habit, had been on horseback that day at last returned home, where his presence was more necessary than ever. We sprang to meet him, kissed his hands, and testified our delight. This seemed much to please him. Well, he said, more kindly than usual, I am glad also for your sakes, my dear children. He immediately ordered that sweetmeats, sweet wine, and the best of everything should be given us, and went to his room 
already surrounded by a crowd of the urging demanding supplicating we had now a fine collation pitied our poor father who would not partake of it and pressed our mother to call him in but she more prudent than we well knew how distasteful such gifts would be to him in the meantime she had prepared some supper and would readily have sent a portion up to his room but he never tolerated such an irregularity even in the most extreme cases and after the sweet things were removed we endeavored to persuade him to come down into the ordinary dining room at last he allowed himself to be persuaded unwillingly and we had no notion of the mischief which we were preparing for him and ourselves the staircase ran through the whole house along all the anterooms my father in coming down had to go directly past the count's apartment this anteroom was so full of people that the count to get through much at once resolved to come out and this happened unfortunately at the moment when my father descended the count met him cheerfully greeted him and remarked you will congratulate yourselves and us that this dangerous affair is so happily terminated by no means replied my father in a rage would that it had driven you to the devil even if i had gone with you the count restrained himself for a moment and then broke out with wrath you shall pay for this cried he you shall find that you have not thus insulted the good cause and myself for nothing my father meanwhile came down very calmly seated himself near us seemed more cheerful than before and began to eat we were glad of this unconscious of the dangerous method in which he had rolled the stone from his heart soon afterwards my mother was called out and we had great pleasure in chattering to our father about the sweet things the count had given us our mother did not return at last the interpreter came in at a hint from him we were sent to bed it was already late and we willingly obeyed after a night quietly slept through we heard of the violent commotion which had shaken the house the previous evening the king's lieutenant had instantly ordered my father to be led to the guard-house the subalterns knew well that he was never to be contradicted yet they had often earned thanks by delaying the execution of his orders the interpreter whose presence of mind never forsook him contrived to excite this disposition in them very strongly the tumult moreover was so great that a delay brought with it its own concealment and excuse he had called out my mother and put the adjutant as it were into her hands that by prayers and representations she might gain a brief postponement of the matter he himself hurried up to the count who with great self-command had immediately retired into the inner room and would rather allow the most urgent affair to stand still than wreak on an innocent person the ill humor once excited in him and give a decision derogatory to his dignity the address of the interpreter to the count the train of the whole conversation were often enough repeated to us by the fat interpreter who prided himself not a little on the fortunate result so that i can still describe it from recollection the interpreter had ventured to open the cabinet and enter an act which was severely prohibited what do you want shouted the count angrily out with you no one but st jean has a right to enter here well suppose i am st jean for a moment answered the interpreter it would need a powerful imagination for that two of him would not make one of such as you retire count you have received a great gift from heaven and to that i appeal you think to flatter me do not fancy you will succeed you have the great gift count of listening to the opinions of others even in moments of passion 
in moments of rage well well the question now is just about opinions to which i have listened too long i know but too well that we are not liked here and that these citizens look askance at us not all very many what these towns will be imperial towns will they they saw their emperor elected and crowned and when being unjustly attacked he is in danger of losing his dominions and surrendering to an usurper when he fortunately finds faithful allies who pour out their blood and treasures in his behalf they will not put up with the slight burden that falls to their share towards humbling the enemy but you have long known these sentiments and have endured them like a wise man they are besides held only by a minority a few dazzled by the splendid qualities of the enemy whom you yourself prize as an extraordinary man a few only as you are aware yes indeed i have known and suffered it too long otherwise this man would not have presumed to utter such insults to my face and at the most critical moment let them be as many as they please they shall be punished in the person of this their audacious representative and perceive what they have to expect only delay count in certain things one cannot act too promptly only a little delay count neighbor you think to mislead me into a false step you shall not succeed i would neither lead you into a false step nor restrain you from one your resolution is just it becomes the frenchman and the king's lieutenant but consider that you are also count thorain he has no right to interfere here but the gallant man has a right to be heard what would he say then king's lieutenant he would begin you have so long had patience with so many gloomy untoward bungling men if they were not really too bad this man has certainly been too bad but control yourself king's lieutenant and everyone will praise and extol you on that account you know i can often endure your jests but do not abuse my good will these men are they then completely blinded suppose we had lost the battle what would have been their fate at this moment we fight up to the gates we shut up the city we halt we defend ourselves to cover our retreat over the bridge think you the enemy would have stood with his hands before him he throws grenades and what he has at hand and they catch where they can this householder what would he have here in these rooms a bomb might now have burst and another have followed it in these rooms the cursed china paper of which i have spared incommoding myself by not nailing up my maps they ought to have spent the whole day on their knees how many would have done that they ought to have prayed for a blessing on us and to have gone out to meet the generals and officers with tokens of honor and joy and the wearied soldiers with refreshments instead of this the poison of party spirit destroys the fairest and happiest moments of my life won by so many cares and efforts it is party spirit but you will only increase it by the punishment of this man those who think with him will proclaim you a tyrant and a barbarian they will consider him a martyr who has suffered for the good cause and even those of the other opinion who are now his opponents will see in him only their fellow citizen will pity him and while they confess your justice will yet feel that you have proceeded too severely 
I have listened to you too much already. Now away with you. Hear only this. Remember, this is the most unheard of thing that could befall this man, this family. You have had no reason to be edified by the good will of the master of the house. But the mistress has anticipated all your wishes, and the children have regarded you as their uncle. With this single blow you will forever destroy the peace and happiness of this dwelling. Indeed, I may say that a bomb falling into the house would not have occasioned greater desolation. I have so often admired your self-command, Count. Give me this time opportunity to adore you. A warrior is worth of honor, who considers himself a guest in the house of an enemy. But here there is no enemy, only a mistaking man. Control yourself, and you will acquire an everlasting fame. That would be odd, replied the Count with a smile. Merely natural, continued the interpreter. I have not sent the wife and children to your feet, because I know you detest such scenes, but I will depict to you this wife and these children, how they will thank you. I will depict them to you conversing all their lives of the Battle of Burgeon and of your magnanimity on this day relating it to their children and children's children, and inspiring even strangers with their own interest for you. An act of this kind can never perish. But you do not hit my weak side yet, interpreter. About posthumous fame I am not in the habit of thinking, that is, for others, not for me. But to do right at the moment, not to neglect my duty, not to prejudice my honor, that is my care. We have already had too many words now. Go, and receive thanks of the thankless whom I spare. The interpreter, surprised and moved by this unexpectedly favorable issue, could not restrain his tears, and would have kissed the Count's hands. The Count motioned him off, and said severely and seriously, You know I cannot bear such things. And with these words he went into the anteroom to attend to his pressing affairs, and heard the claims of so many expectant persons. So the matter was disposed of, and the next morning we celebrated, with the remnants of yesterday's sweetmeats, the passing over of an evil through the threatenings of which we had happily slept. Whether the interpreter really spoke so wisely, or merely so painted the scene to himself, as one is apt to do after a good and fortunate action, I will not decide. At least he never varied it in repeating it. Indeed, this day seemed to him both the most anxious and the most glorious in his life. One little incident will show how the Count, in general, rejected all false parade, never assumed a title which did not belong to him, and how witty he was in his most cheerful moods. A man of the higher class, who was one of the abstruse, solitary Frankfurters, thought he must complain of the quartering of the soldiers upon him. He came in person, and the interpreter preferred him his services, but the other supposed that he did not need them. He came before the Count with the most becoming bow, and said, Your Excellency. The Count returned the bow, as well as the Excellency. Struck by this mark of honor, and not supposing, but that the title was too humble, he stooped lower and said, Monsignor. Sir, said the Count very seriously, we will not go farther, or else we may easily bring it to majesty. The other gentleman was extremely confused, and had not a word to utter. The interpreter, standing at some distance and apprised of the whole affair, was wicked enough not to move, but the Count, with much cheerfulness, continued. Well now, for instance, sir, what is your name? Spangenberg, replied the other, and mine, said the Count, is Thorain. Spangenberg, 
what is your business with Thorain? Now then, let us sit down. The affair shall at once be settled. And thus the affair was indeed settled at once, to the great satisfaction of the person I have here named Spangenberg. And the same evening, in our family circle, the story was not only told by the waggish interpreter, but was given with all the circumstances and gestures. After these confusions, disquietudes, and grievances, the former security and thoughtlessness soon returned, in which the young particularly live from day to day, if it be in any degree possible. My passion for the French theatre grew with every performance. I did not miss an evening, though on every occasion, when after the play, I sat down with the family to supper, often putting up with the remains. I had to endure my father's constant reproaches, that theatres were useless and would lead to nothing. In these cases I adduced all and every argument which is at hand for the apologists of the stage when they fall into a difficulty like mine. Vice in prosperity and virtue in misfortune are in the end set right by poetical justice. Those beautiful examples of misdeeds punished, Miss Sarah Sampson, and the merchant of london were very energetically cited on my part but on the other hand i often came off worst when the foiberies de scappen and others of the sort were in the bill and i was forced to bear reproaches for the delight felt by the public in the deceits of intriguing servants and the successful follies of prodigal young men neither party was convinced but my father was very soon reconciled to the theatre when he saw that I had advanced with incredible rapidity in the French language. Men are so constituted that everybody would rather undertake himself what he sees done by others, whether he has aptitude for it or not. I had soon exhausted the whole range of the French stage. Several plays were performed for the third and fourth times, all had passed before my eyes and mind. From the stateliest tragedy to the most frivolous afterpiece, and as when a child I had presumed to imitate Terence, I did not fail now as a boy, on a much more inciting occasion, to copy the French forms to the best of my ability and want of ability. There were then performed some half-mythological, half-allegorical pieces in the taste of Piron, they partook somewhat of the nature of parody and were much liked. These representations particularly attracted me. The little gold wings of a lively Mercury, the thunderbolt of a disguised Jupiter, an amorous Danae, or by whatever name a fair one visited by the gods might be called, if indeed it were not a shepherdess or huntress to whom they descended. And as elements of this kind from Ovid's Metamorphoses or the Pantheon Mythicum of Pome were humming in swarms about my head, I had soon put together in my imagination a little piece of the kind of which I can only say that the scene was rural and that there was no lack in it of kings, daughters, princes, or gods. Mercury especially made so vivid an impression on me that I could almost be sworn that I had seen him with my own eyes. I presented my friend Derones with a very neat copy made by myself, which he accepted with quite a special grace, and with a truly patronizing air, glanced hastily over the manuscript, pointed out a few grammatical blunders, found some speeches too long, and at last promised to examine and judge the work more attentively when he had the requisite leisure. To my modest question, whether the piece could by any chance be performed, he assured me that it was not altogether impossible. In the theater, he said, a great deal went by favor, and he would support me with all his heart only the affair must be kept private, 
for he himself once on a time surprised the directors with a piece of his own and it would certainly have been acted if it had not been too soon detected that he was the author i promised him all possible silence and already saw in my mind's eye the name of my piece posted up in large letters on the corners of the streets and squares light-minded as my friend generally was the opportunity of playing the master was but too desirable he read the piece through with attention and while he sat down with me to make some trivial alterations turned the whole thing in the course of the conversation completely topsy-turvy so that not one stone remained on another he struck out added took away one character substituted another in short went on with the maddest wantonness in the world so that my hair stood on end my previous persuasion that he must surely understand the matter allowed him to have his way for he had often laid before me so much about the three unities of aristotle the regularity of the french drama the probability the harmony of the verse and all that belongs to these that i was forced to regard him not merely as informed but thoroughly grounded he abused the english and scorned the germans in short he laid before me the whole dramaturgic litany which i have so often in my life been compelled to hear like the boy in the fable i carried my mangled offspring home and strove in vain to bring it to life as however i would not quite abandon it i caused a fair copy of my first manuscript after a few alterations to be made by our clerk which i presented to my father and thus gained so much that for a long time he let me eat my supper in quiet after the play was over this unsuccessful attempt made me reflective and i resolved now to learn at the very sources these theories these laws to which every one appealed but which had become suspicious to me chiefly through the impoliteness of my arrogant master this was not indeed difficult but laborious i immediately read cornelli's treatise on the three unities and learned from that how people would have it but why they desired it so was by no means clear to me and what was worst of all i fell at once into still greater confusion when i made myself acquainted with the disputes on the cid and read the prefaces in which corneali and racine are obliged to defend themselves against the critics and the public here at least i plainly saw that no man knew what he wanted that a piece like the cid which had produced the noblest effect was to be condemned at the command of an all-powerful cardinal that racine the idol of the french living in my day who had now also become my idol for i had got immediately acquainted with him when schof von Ohenschlager made us children act britannicus in which the part of nero fell to me that racine i say even in his own day was not able to get on with the amateurs nor critics through all this i became more perplexed than ever and after having pestered myself a long time with this talking backwards and forwards and theoretical quackery of the previous century threw them to the dogs and was the more resolute in casting all the rubbish away the more i thought i observed that the authors themselves who had procured excellent things when they began to speak about them when they set forth the grounds of their treatment when they desired to defend justify or excuse themselves were not always able to hit the proper mark i hastened back again therefore to the living present attended the theatre far more zealously read more scrupulously and connectedly so that i had a perseverance enough this time to work through the whole of racine and moliere and a great part of corneale the king's lieutenant still lived at our house 
he in no respect had changed his deportment especially towards us but it was observable and the interpreter made it still more evident to us that he no longer discharged his duties with the same cheerfulness and zeal as at the outset though always with the same rectitude and fidelity his character and habits which showed the spaniard rather than the frenchman his caprices which were not without their influence on his business his unbending will under all circumstances his susceptibility as to whatever had reference to his person or reputation all this together might perhaps sometimes bring him into conflict with his superiors add to this that he had been wounded in a duel which had arisen in the theatre and it was deemed wrong that the king's lieutenant himself chief of police should have committed a punishable offence as i have said all this may have contributed to make him live more retired and here and there perhaps to act with less energy at this point in the story there is an illustration a woman spinning and another reading while a child plays nearby the story continues meanwhile a considerable part of the pictures he had ordered had been delivered count thorain passed his leisure hours in examining them while in the foresaid gable room he had them nailed up canvas after canvas large and small side by side and because there was want of space even one over another and then taken down and rolled up the works were constantly inspected anew the parts that were considered the most successful were repeatedly enjoyed but there was no want of wishes that this or that had been differently done hence arose a new and very singular operation as one painter best executed figures another middle grounds and distances a third trees a fourth flowers it struck the count that these talents might perhaps be combined in the paintings and that in this way perfect works might be produced a beginning was made at once by having for instance some beautiful cattle painted into a finished landscape but because there was not always adequate room for all and a few sheep more or less was no great matter to the cattle painter the largest landscape proved in the end too narrow now also the painter of figures had to introduce the shepherd and some travellers these deprived each other of air as we may say and we marvelled that they were not all stifled even in the most open country no one could anticipate what was to come of the matter and when it was finished it gave no satisfaction the painters were annoyed they had gained something by their first orders but lost by these after labors though the count paid for them also very liberally and as the parts worked into each other in one picture by several hands produced no good effect after all the trouble every one at last fancied that his own work had been spoiled and destroyed by that of the others hence the artists were within a hair's breadth of falling out and becoming irreconcilably hostile to each other these alterations or rather additions were made in the before-mentioned studio where i remained quite alone with the artists and it amused me to hunt out from the studies particularly of animals this or that individual or group and to propose it for the foreground or the distance in which respect they many times either from conviction or kindness complied with my wishes the partners in this affair were therefore greatly discouraged especially sea cats a very hypochondriacal retired man who indeed by his incomparable humour was the best of companions among friends but who when he worked desired to work alone abstracted and perfectly free this man after solving difficult problems and finishing them with the greatest diligence and the warmest love of which he was always capable was forced to travel repeatedly from dromstadt to frankfurt 
either to change something in his own pictures or to touch up those of others or even to allow under his superintendence a third person to convert his pictures into a variegated mess his peevishness augmented his resistance became more decided and a great deal of effort was also necessary on our part to guide this gossip for he was one also according to the count's wishes i still remember that when the boxes were standing ready to pack up all the pictures in the order in which the upholsterer might hang them up at once at their place of destination a small but indispensable bit of afterwork was demanded but sea cats would not be moved to come over he had by way of conclusion done the best he could having represented in paintings to be placed over the doors the four elements as children and boys after life and having expended the greatest care not only on the figures but on the accessories these were delivered and paid for and he thought he was quit of the business forever but now he was to come over again that he might enlarge by a few touches of his pencil some figures the size of which was too small another he thought could do it just as well he had already set about some new work in short he would not come the time for sending off the pictures was at hand they had moreover to get dry every delay was untoward and the count in despair was about to have him fetched in military fashion we all wished to see the pictures finally gone and found at last no expedient than for the gossip interpreter to seat himself in a wagon and fetch over the refractory subject with his wife and child he was kindly received by the count well treated and at last dismissed with liberal payment after the pictures had been sent away there was great peace in the house the gable room in the attic was cleaned and given up to me and my father when he saw the boxes go could not refrain from wishing to send off the count after them for much as the tastes of the counts coincided with his own much as he must have rejoiced to see his principle of patronizing living artists so generously followed out by a man richer than himself much as it may have flattered him that his collection had been the occasion of bringing so considerable a profit to a number of brave artists in a pressing time he nevertheless felt such a repugnance to the foreigner who had intruded into his house that he could not think well of any of his doings one ought to employ painters but not degrade them to paper stainers one ought to be satisfied with what they have done according to their conviction and ability even if it does not thoroughly please one and not be perpetually carping at it in short in spite of all the count's own generous endeavors there could once for all be no mutual understanding my father only visited that room when the count was at table and i can recall but one instance when sea cats having excelled himself and the wish to see these pictures having brought the whole house together my father and the count met and manifested a common pleasure in these works of art which they could not take in each other scarcely therefore had the house been cleared of the chests and boxes than the plan for removing the count which had formerly been begun but was afterwards interrupted was resumed the endeavor was made to gain justice by representations equity by entreaties favor by influence and the quartermasters were prevailed upon to decide thus the count was to change his lodgings and our house in consideration of the burden borne day and night for several years uninterruptedly was to be exempt for the future from billeting but to furnish a plausible pretext for this we were to take in lodgers on the first floor which the count had occupied and thus render a new quartering as it were impossible the count who after the separation of his dear pictures felt no further peculiar interest in the house 
and hoped moreover to be soon recalled and placed elsewhere was pleased to move without opposition to another good residence and left us in peace and good will soon afterwards he quitted the city and received different appointments in gradation but it was rumored not to his own satisfaction meanwhile he had the pleasure of seeing the pictures which he had preserved with so much care felicitously arranged in his brother's chateau he wrote sometimes sent dimensions and had different pieces executed by the artist so often named at last we heard nothing further about him except after several years we were assured that he had died as governor of one of the french colonies in the west indies end of section eleven